Hi guys, this is part two of your video notes for unit three. Um, today we're going to be talking about using the periodic table, how to read it, and some of the things that it can tell us before we get into part three, which is going to be about periodic families. So looking at the periodic table, you should know from your video and from your notes, it is organized two ways. We can go across, so every time we go across in a row, that's called a period. And we can also look at it up and down. So looking up and down, we're looking at groups or families. And you'll notice that all the rows are numbered here on the left-hand side. So we've got rows 1 through 7. And then across the top, we have groups 1 through 18. So everything starting here down is group 1, group 2, group 3, all the way up to 16, 17, 18, going from left to right. So we're going to go ahead and write that down. So using the periodic table, my rows, which go left and right, horizontally, are called periods. And my columns, which go up and down vertically, are called groups. They're also called families. Okay, so rows are periods, columns are groups and families. The other thing that's nice to know about the periodic table when we're talking about group numbers is that you can tell the number of valence electrons that an atom has by looking at its group. So we talked about last week valence electrons are the electrons on the outside of the atom and those are the only electrons that are involved in bonding. We're going to get to bonding next week, but just for now, no valence electrons on the outside of the atom. You can have one valence electron, you can have up to eight, so no fewer than one, no more than eight. And I can tell the number of valence electrons that a family has by looking at its group number. So up here we've got group number one, starting with hydrogen, and then lithium, sodium, potassium. These all have one valence electron. So group one has one valence electron. Group two, everything from here down, has two valence electrons. And then we're not going to get into this part down here. These are called the transition metals. We're going to jump over those for now. But if we come over here to group 13, so we went one, two, 13, 13 has three valence electrons. Group 14 has four valence electrons. So you can just look at the group number and take away the one, and that tells you how many valence electrons it has. So group 15 has five valence electrons. Group 16 has six. Group 17 has seven. And then group 18, we say it has a full shell because it has the maximum. It has eight valence electrons. So everything from helium down to 118 has eight valence electrons. Okay, so our group numbers tell us the number of valence electrons. We're going to write that down. Group numbers tell us the number of valence electrons. All right. The other thing that you need to know to be able to read the periodic table, so we're going to look at it one more time. If I look at just one of these little boxes, every box is a different element. So if I look at just one of these boxes, I can see I've got a whole number up here at the top. I've got a letter, or sometimes two letters. I've got the name of the element, and then I've got a number with a decimal on it. So looking at my big zoomed in version right here, that whole number that you see in that box is going to be your atomic number. So my atomic number is always the whole number in that box. And one more time from last week, your atomic number is the number of protons in your atom, number of protons in the nucleus. And if you have a neutral atom, it's also the number of electrons that you have. So nitrogen, its atomic number is seven. So it has seven protons and seven electrons, okay? 
We're going to jump over here to the number with the decimal on it. Remember I said there's a whole number and there's a number with a decimal? That number with the decimal is going to be my atomic mass. Atomic mass. And if you remember from last week from your vocab, atomic mass is the average of all of the isotopes of that atom averaged together. So it's the average of all the isotopes of the atom. So for nitrogen, 14.007 is the average of all the isotopes of nitrogen. Okay? The big letter, or sometimes two letters, is your elemental symbol. So element symbol. That's your abbreviation for the name, basically. And then lastly, this one should be obvious, you've got your element name. So four things in every box. We've got atomic number, it's the whole number. Atomic mass is the number with the decimal. Our element symbol can be either one letter or two letters. And our element name is usually at the bottom of that box. All right? So when we look at the periodic table, one of the things we can do is we can break it up into three big groups. So the biggest group that you're going to find on the periodic table are metals. So metals make up most of the periodic table. I'm going to write that down. I want to abbreviate periodic table PT. And you can too, as long as you know what that means in your notes. So metals make up most of the periodic table. They are usually shiny or lustrous. So lustrous was a word that we talked about when we did physical and chemical properties. It just means shiny. Metals are good conductors of both heat and electricity. They are ductile. So ductile means that they can be stretched into wires. They are malleable which means they can be pressed into sheets like aluminum foil. And at room temperature, most of our elements and almost all of our metals are going to be solids. So we're going to write that they're solids at room temperature. Okay? So that takes care of our metals. And our metals, looking at our sheet, are basically, we're going to get rid of hydrogen. Hydrogen's not a metal but almost everything from here down to about this zigzag line right here, almost everything on the left side of the table is going to be a metal, including these guys down here. These are your inner transition metals, okay? So I said there was a zigzag line right about here. Those guys are going to be the metalloids, and then everything on the right of them is going to be a non-metal plus hydrogen, okay? So looking at nonmetals, nonmetals, we said metals are usually solids, nonmetals are usually gases. So they're usually gases at room temperature. They are usually brittle. So we said that metals could be stretched and they could be flattened out. If you try to do that with a nonmetal, it'll probably break. So they're brittle, they can break easily, and they're poor conductors. So heat and electricity don't really move through nonmetals very well. Okay? So nonmetals are on the right side of the table, metals are on the left, and in between, you've got these guys called the metalloids. So metalloids are on the border between metals and nonmetals. and non-metals. So we said that metals are good conductors, non-metals are bad conductors, metalloids are what we call semiconductors. So semiconductors 
do allow electricity and heat to move through them, but not as well as metals do. So they're usually used in things like computers, where you want electricity to move through them, but you don't want it to short out. Um, Nonmetals, or excuse me, metalloids are usually solids. And they have properties of both metals and nonmetals. They're in between. We're going to write that down. Have properties of metals and nonmetals. So, three categories metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. Metals are shiny, they're good conductors, they can be stretched and flattened, they're solids, they make up most of the periodic table. Nonmetals are usually gases, they're brittle, they don't conduct heat and electricity. And metalloids are somewhere in between. They're semiconductors, they're usually solids, and they have properties of both metals and nonmetals. So in part three, we're going to split these three groups up even more. We're going to start talking about the periodic families. So go ahead and start part three now.